Amendments and votes are expected throughout the day. The U.S. House also gaveling in at this hour to begin debate on small business reporting requirements, about two and a half hours debate on that bill that uh, would change that reporting requirement in the health care law. Now, li now live Senate coverage here on C-SPAN 2. Black will lead the Senate in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, eternal and unchangeable, you have ordained that day follows night and that in trials we find our triumph. Keep our lawmakers aware of your goodness and mercies which never fail. Lift them above contention and disappointment to an optimism that trusts the unfolding of your loving providence. May they also live with the awareness that our times are in your hands. Lord, Give our senators the wisdom to rededicate themselves to the doing of your will so that this nation may yet shine with the beauty of righteousness and justice as a citadel of healing, wisdom, and strength. We pray in your merciful name, amen. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The clerk will read a communication to the Senate. Washington, D.C., March 3, 2011, to the Senate. Under provisions of Rule 1, Paragraph 3 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, I hereby appoint the Honorable Tom Udall, a senator from the state of New Mexico, to perform the duties of the chair. Signed, Daniel K. Noe, President Pro Tempore. The, the, the uh, clerk will call the roll. Okay. Alexander. Recognized. Pulling any, I, I ask consent. The Senate is currently without objection. Ms. President, following any leader remarks, the Senate will proceed to a period of morning business until 11 this morning. The Senate is permitted to speak for up to 10 minutes each. The Republicans will control the first half, and the majority will control the final half. At 11, the Senate will resume consideration of S-23, the American Invents Act. I would hope, Ms. President, if people have amendments that they want to offer to this legislation, they would do so. I would hope that they would be germane, but there's no restrictions. They, people can offer whatever amendments they want on this matter. 
There will be a, uh, but I would like, I would hope that we can do that. We had an important amendment offered by Senator Feinstein yesterday. It's a, it's an extremely important measure. I'm supportive of that. It's, it's an issue that I think we shouldn't uh, try to fix something that in that area of patent reform that's not broken. But the patent reform bill is important. We have 750,000 patents that have been applied, applied for, and there's been no response from the patent office. One of the big issues that we had uh, was how we're going to pay for this work that they have to do. And we had a novel idea. Senator Coburn, it's my understanding, came up with the idea first, have the patent office pay for it. With the applications that people file, that money would go to the patent office to get rid of that backlog. In the past, as I understand it, those monies have gone to the general fund. And so that issue was going to be a big uh, debatable issue on this bill, but there was a bipartisan agreement that we should take care of that. That's in the manager's package, so that's good. So the other issue is on the first file. Senator Feinstein offered that amendment. We'll have a vote on that as soon as we can. And um, I would hope that if there are other amendments, we can get to them quickly. There will be a period of morning business from 2 to 4 today. The majority will control the first hour. The Republicans will control the next hour. Senators should expect roll call votes in relation to amendments to the American Competes Act to occur, to occur throughout the day. Mr. President. Republican leaders recognized. For two years now, Washington Democrats have taken fiscal recklessness to new heights. They've spent trillions of dollars we don't have on things we don't need and can't afford. The amount of red ink Democrats plan to rack up this year alone would exceed all of the debt run up by the federal government from its inception through 1984. The recklessness is the reason we've seen a national uprising against their policies. Now, Americans have demanded that we reverse this recklessness and restore balance. Democrats have resisted at every turn. To conceal the extent of their spending plans, they didn't even pass a budget last year. After a nationwide repudiation of their policies in November, they proposed a massive spending bill loaded with new spending that amounted to a slap in the face to the voters. Following the outrage that provoked, they tried to get a spending freeze past the public. They said, how about we just lock in place the out-of-control spending levels we set last year? To them, this entire debate isn't about how to respond to the American people. It's about seeing what they can get away with. Well, Republicans have taken a different approach. Responding to our constituents, we've insisted the status quo simply won't cut it anymore. We've insisted on actually shrinking the size of government. And yesterday, we delivered by forcing the first actual cut in government spending in recent memory. While it was just a small first step, yesterday we showed it is actually possible to change the status quo in Washington. Not bad. What about the White House? The White House responded to all of this by announcing they want to have a meeting. We're happy to go to the meeting. But putting a meeting on the schedule doesn't change the fact that neither the White House nor a single Democrat in Congress has proposed a plan that would allow the government to remain open and that would respond to the voters by reining in spending. All we get is talk. The President made an audacious assertion yesterday after the two-week CR was passed. He said he wants his advisors to come up with a plan that, quote, makes sure we're living within our means. Live within our means? Let me remind you, Mr. President, that the President's budget has us amassing a national debt of more than $20 trillion within the next five years. Amassing a national debt of over $20 trillion within the next five years. We're projected to spend more than $1.6 trillion this year alone, more than we're taking in. That's a $1.6 trillion deficit this year. Does this mean we can expect the President's budget director to present us with a piece of paper that outlines $1.6 trillion in cuts for the current fiscal year? If so, that's great news. If the President's measure of success, as he said, is a plan that makes sure we actually live within our means, the way most people do, count on me showing up early for this meeting. Unfortunately, I suspect the President is once again just saying something he thinks uh, people want to hear. 
The fact is, if Democrats had a plan of their own that would cut one dollar in spending, I think we would have seen it by now. But we haven't. Democrats have abdicated all responsibility for their own recklessness over the last two years. They've left us to do something about it. We made a step in the right direction yesterday after months of resistance on their part. Now we look forward to their plan. It's time for Democrats to prevent, present a serious plan of their own that addresses this crisis. It's time for Democrats to take the concerns of the American people seriously. Pre under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. Under the previous order, the Senate will be in a period of morning business until 11 a.m., with senators permitted to speak therein for up to 10 minutes each, with the time equally divided and controlled between the two leaders or their designees, with the Republicans controlling the first half and the majority control the, controlling the final half. Republican leader. Mr. President. My friend and colleague from Kentucky, Senator Paul, and I would like at this point to address the Senate about a bill we will be uh, introducing. Uh, coal is an enormously vital sector of Kentucky's economy. More than 200,000 jobs in my state depend on it, including the jobs of approximately 18,000 coal miners. Coal is tremendously important to our country as well. One half of the country's electricity comes from coal. And yet, as we're faced with a weakened economy and high unemployment, an overreaching environmental protection agency in Washington is blocking new jobs for Kentuckians and Americans by waging a literal war on coal. To mine for coal, coal operators must receive what are called 404 permits. Those come from the EPA in order to operate. One such mine in southern West Virginia followed all of the proper procedures, got the green light from EPA to proceed with operations back in 2007. But now, three and a half years later, in an unprecedented reversal, the EPA has retroactively reinterpreted its authority, withdrawn the permit it issued, and shut down the mine. The EPA's reinterpretation cost 280 Americans their jobs. The EPA also announced that 79 of the 404 permit applications still being considered would be subject to enhanced environmental review. Enhanced environmental review. Effectively putting them in limbo, along with jobs and economic activity they could create. Some of those permits are for jobs in Kentucky. The EPA's action simply defies logic. Not only are they changing the rules in the middle of the game, they are retroactively changing the rules to shut down mines they already approved. No mine, regardless of whether it has been operating for years in full compliance of every rule and regulation, can be assured that Uncle Sam won't come along and shut them down. And thousands of Kentuckians who work in coal mining or have jobs dependent on mining are literally in jeopardy. Other industries are at risk also. Farmers, developers, the transportation industry, and others also need permits from EPA to continue to operate. They too could see these permits revoked. The EPA has turned the permitting process into a backdoor means of shutting down coal mines by sitting on permits indefinitely, thus removing any regulatory certainty. What they're doing is outside the scope of their authority and the law and represents a fundamental departure from the permitting process as originally envisioned by Congress. That's why I rise today to introduce, along with my good friend Senator Rand Paul and Senator James Inhofe, the Mining Jobs Protection Act here in the Senate. This bill will tell EPA to use it or lose it when deciding whether to invoke its veto authority of a 404 permit within a reasonable time frame giving permit applications the certainty they need to do business. The bill would ensure that all 404 permits move forward to be either approved or rejected so applicants aren't left in limbo, unsure how to act. The bill also ensures that EPA cannot use its veto retroactively. 
While being fair to permit applicants, the bill still preserves the EPA's full authority to protect human health and the environment. Here's how the legislation would work. Once the EPA receives a 404 permit, it will have 30 days to determine if it's considering using its veto authority. If the agency is considering doing so, it must publish that fact in the Federal Register, cite any potential concerns, and detail what must be done to address those concerns within the initial 30 days. The EPA then has an additional 30 days for a total of two months to invoke its veto authority. If the agency does not use its veto authority within 60 days, the permit automatically moves forward and EPA's veto authority expires. All permits that have already been applied for would go through this process, ensuring every permit gets a fair shake. Any permits vetoed prior to the passage of the bill would be reconsidered by the Army Corps of Engineers. And it was important to me that this legislation address every 404 permit, not just one or a few. This is a fair process that allows the EPA to act as vigorously as necessary to protect the environment and those of us living in it, while also giving permit applications the certainty of knowing within a reasonable time frame whether or not to proceed with mining operations, and knowing that once they have the green light, it's not going to be subsequently revoked. More important, this legislation will allow my state and others to protect the coal and related industry jobs that we already have and grow new ones in the future. So I want to thank my colleague from Kentucky and uh, Senator Inhofe for standing alongside me on this matter that is so important to our states, but also for the country as a whole. This is not just a Kentucky issue. We think our bill strikes a fair balance toward conserving the best of America's natural beauty while also building toward a brighter future. Mr. President, the EPA's mission is important, but so is job creation. And particularly when unemployment is higher than all of us would like, both sides of that equation must be considered. So I look forward to working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to make the Mining Jobs and Protection Act a law. And Mr. President, I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Kentucky is recognized. I rise in support of this legislation. I think this is a good first step to reining in an out-of-control, unelected bureaucracy. I think the EPA has gone way beyond its mandated duty and is now at the point of stifling industry in our country. You see this and hear this across the state of Kentucky, but across the country. The president doesn't seem to understand why the country thinks that he's against business and against progress. You can't be for job creation if you're against the job creators. As the minority leader indicated, we have nearly 100,000 jobs and hundreds of thousands of other jobs connected to coal. And it really applies to the rest of the country as well. Over half of the electricity in our country comes from coal. Over 90% of the electricity in Kentucky comes from coal. And yet you have mining operations who went through the process some of them taking up to 10 years. I think the mine in question went through a 10-year process, spent millions of dollars to try to get started to provide electricity for the rest of us, and yet then the EPA comes in at the last minute. There is said to be nearly 200 permits that are out there languishing. I asked the question of my staff this morning. I said, well, how many have been applied for and how many have granted? The EPA won't even tell us that. But from talking to those trying to produce the coal, to produce the electricity for our country, they say they can't get permits. In fact, there's one coal company in Kentucky who is now suing the federal government saying they've taken his property. They've effectively taken his property because he can't get a permit. This is a real problem. The average expectancy for getting a permit in our country now for all mines is seven years. We wonder why we're languishing and everyone else, we depend on everyone else for natural resources, for our energy, and we want to be energy independent, and yet we sit atop some of the greatest world's natural resources in coal and oil, and yet we won't produce our own. We have to become so involved, and there's so many justifications for war across the world because of oil and this and that, and yet we refuse to use our own resources. 
This is a very good first step in trying to make the process better. All it's saying is that the EPA cannot have unlimited time to sit on our permits. This is saying that there have to be rules. But I say this is a first step because I think the last election was about saying that unelected bureaucrats should not write law. That's what's happening. The president and many of his supporters have indicated that cap and trade, they can't get it through the elected body, that they're going to go the back door through regulations. The American people need to stand up and say, unelected bureaucrats should not and cannot be allowed to write law. That's essentially what's happening now, and I think this is a great first step, and I compliment the minority leader for bringing this forward, and I wholeheartedly support it. And I relinquish my time. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kaka. two senators from the coal producing state of Kentucky talking about uh, legislation dealing with coal and as you see on the bottom of your screen the EPA administrator is testifying on her department's budget one of several budget hearings underway now and live now on cspan.org Lisa Jackson testifying also the homeland security secretary Janet Napolitano as testifying right now that's live online and it's also live on C-SPAN 3. One other cabinet secretary testifying, that's Kathleen Sebelius testifying on the Health and Human Services uh, budget. Well, Mitch McConnell, the minority leader, was talking about the 2011 budget, the continuing res resolution passed in the Senate yesterday. President Obama signed it late yesterday afternoon. And the Associated Press reports this morning that the White House is looking to arrange a meeting be today between congressional leaders and Vice President Biden to begin negotiating negotiating that spending bill to fund the government through um, uh, the end of the fiscal year in September. They say that White House Chief of Staff William Daley and Budget Director Jacob Liu met with House Democratic leaders yesterday ahead of a larger bipartisan gathering being planned. No word, no final word on um, where, when, and if that meeting is getting underway. Here on the Senate floor today, they continue debate on an overhaul to patent law, which would largely shift patent awards away from the current first to invent system to a first to file system possible amendments and votes throughout the day today and CQ writes that this long pending patent overhaul is ultimately expected to win Senate, win Senate passage in the next week but it would face uncertainty in the US House where lawmakers are drafting their own version of the legislation also, one more piece of uh, Senate news announced late yesterday. Senator, Senator Daniel Akaka of Hawaii is announcing that he will retire next year. He becomes the seventh senator and the fifth Democrat to forego another term in 2012.
President. Senator from Virginia is recognized. Mr. President, I ask that the proceedings of the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. Mr. President, I ask to uh, speak for up to eight minutes on the, uh, of the Democratic time. Without objection. Mr. President, uh, I rise today uh, to honor another great federal employee and a constituent of mine from uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia. As we um, uh, debate this week and over the coming weeks about uh, making sure that the federal government stays open, um, I think it's important to realize that uh, what we're talking about are the, the real lives of, of uh, many of our great federal employees who provide the services day in and day out um, to make sure that uh, many important public purposes are served. And uh, this is an initiative uh, I know the, the presiding officer realizes that our, our former colleague, the, the senator from, from Delaware, started. Uh, I've been proud uh, when Senator Kaufman moved on uh, uh, to um, pick up that mantle of, on a regular basis, coming to the floor of the Senate and recognizing federal employees uh, who often, in a very unsung way, uh, do great things for uh, our country. And uh, the federal employee that I'm going to recognize today is someone that uh, I think uh, the presiding officer, who I know spends a lot of time in the air coming from his, the great state of New Mexico, uh, will, will be particularly interested. I know my colleague, the senator from Illinois, who's here, spends a lot of time in the air as well. And um, uh, that's the subject of uh, what we're going to be talking about today. You know, nearly two million people in the United States take to the skies every day. Once in flight, their safety relies on the diligent work of individuals responsible for ensuring that airplanes are well designed and safe. When we reach our destination, as we most often do, it is because of their tireless work. In the rare moments when accidents happen, we rely on individuals like Robert Benzing, who possesses the skill and innovative thinking to find the causes of accidents and ensure that we don't make the same mistakes twice. Robert Benson is a, safe, is a senior air safety investigator with the National Transportation Safety Board. His job is to investigate aircraft incidents and accidents. He analyzes the equipment and data, identifies the causes of the accident, and makes recommendations to the industry on how to improve safety. He be began his career flying combat missions in Vietnam as an Air Force pilot. In 1984, 1984, that was long before many of these pages here were even born, he went to work for the National Transportation Safety Board in Chicago. Over his 25-year career, he has served as the lead investigator in several high-profile cases and is considered the best in his field. More than 80% of his team's recommendations had been adopted by the industry. In 1996, Mr. Benson led the investigation of TWA Flight 800 crash into the Atlantic Ocean. His investigation following this crash led to the recommendations that oxygen con contained in aircraft fuel tanks be replaced with another non-burning gas like nitrogen to prevent fuel tank explosions. In 2001, Mr. Benson led the investigation of the fatal crash of American Airlines Flight 587 in Queens, New York. His investigation led to an industry-wide redesign of the rudder system, as well as changes to pilot training programs for similar aircrafts. Mr. Benson also led the investigation of U.S. Airways Flight 1549, known nationwide as the miracle on the Hudson, which made Captain Sullenberger a household name in this country. His investigation included an analysis of the engine damage in black box flight recorders, interviews with the pilots, cabin crew, air traffic controllers and passengers, and meetings with both manufacturers of the airplanes and its engines. Mr. Benson has also been a strong advocate for the collection of more in-flight data points from flight recorder black boxes, which he believes are critical to the understanding of what exactly may have gone wrong during a flight. His efforts have led to a significant increase in data from less than 10 data points collected in flights, over 1,000. In an interview, Mr. Benson said, my work is a way of giving back. I get a good feeling that after every one of these investigations is over, it is 
in his work has been a service to the country. It is this sentiment that inspires me to highlight great federal employees on the Senate floor. There are countless federal employees who dedicate their lives to making sure that the rest of our lives are better and safer. Every day that we set foot on an airplane and arrive safely at our destination, we have Robert Benson and his team and countless others to thank. I hope that my Senate colleagues will join me in honoring Robert Benson and all those at the National Transportation Safety Board for their dedicated services and important contributions to our nation's aviation safety. Uh, Mr. President, I know you share uh, in this well regard for uh, this great federal employee and the many others who uh, tirelessly serve to uh, make our country a better place. It's, it's my hope that in the coming weeks we can come to some resolution so that these federal employees can know for the balance of this fiscal year that the federal government will stay in operation, will stay running, and uh, that they can continue to do their work. With that, uh, Mr. President, uh, I yield the floor and note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Okaka. The, the senator from Illinois is Pre recognized. I ask a consent that we dispense with the court. Without objection. Mr. President, with the um, cold-blooded murder of four Americans by pirates, our country faces a dangerous enemy as old as the second Washington administration and the earliest days of the United States Navy. This danger now stretches across our vital oil supply lines and threatens not just Americans, handing out Bibles at Indian Ocean ports of call, but our vital supply of energy. I think it's time to recall the tough choices made by the Jefferson administration to suppress 21st century pirates in this new chapter. We may forget that uh, as much as 10% of all federal revenues were paid by the Washington administration to the Barbary pirates operating in what became Libya. Payments continued under the Adams and Jefferson administrations. But as always with kidnappers and pirates, ransoms only led to more danger on the high seas. In 1801, President Thomas Jefferson decided that continued payments of tribute to the Barbary pirates in exchange for safe passage of American shipping had gone far enough. Over the next five years, Jefferson sent the, United, the new United States Navy, ironically built over his objection, to attack and defeat the pirates. The conflict that followed gave us a new American hero, especially Captain Stephen Decatur. It was Decatur's exploits that were very dangerous, but inevitably successful, even involving close quarters combat. In his honor, my state of Illinois named one of our major cities after him and placed a statue to Captain Decatur in its center. In the end, piracy was defeated and the flag of the United States was not strongly challenged by any future pirates until this century. In the wake of the murder of four Americans by Somali pirates, we need to recall Jefferson's policy under what I would call the Decatur Initiative against Indian Ocean pirates. Since 2006, pirates attacked more and more vessels, 
Uh, there were over 400 attacks just last year. According to the New York Times, modern-day pirates in the 21st century currently hold 50 vessels and over 800 hostages. According to the International Maritime Bureau, pirates murdered 379 people on the high seas, with an additional 199 individuals reported missing between 1993 and 2009. According to reports, a typical ransom for pirates in 2005 was between $100,000 and $200,000. But by 2008, the ransom grew to between $500,000 and $2 million. A year later, in 2009, the average ransom paid uh, grew again to a range of $1.5 to $3.5 million. And in late 2010, ransoms hovered around $4 million per vessel. Ransom payments as high as $9.5 million for a tanker carrying crude oil have now reportedly been made, according to the media. Recently, pirates captured another super tanker worth $200 million carrying 2 million barrels of oil bound for the United States. Its ransom may become the mother load for pirates to extend their reefs across the Indian Ocean and possibly into the Red Sea or the Persian Gulf. We would be naive not to be concerned that many of the profits from these operations would then be used to support terrorism against the West. The Horn of Africa is critically important, not just to the U.S. economy, but to our global market because it is astride a major artery of international shipping. The oil tankers that pass by these waters uh, provide much of the world's supply of energy. And to protect our own economy, we cannot risk their safety. This region is also a potential incubator of growth for two burgeoning Al-Qaeda franchises, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb and Somalia's Al-Shabaab group, which has pledged its loyalty to Osama bin Laden. Now, yesterday, I raised this issue with our Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton. She hinted that our policy may be changing, and that is welcome news. I asked, if we can't be tough on pirates, well, who can we be tough on? Today, I'd like to announce the start of initiative here in the Senate to draft legislation and support for a tougher new administration policy along the lines of Thomas Jefferson's policy on pirates. These legislative concepts could be collectively called the Decatur Initiative, named after, of course, Stephen Decatur and his most famous mission to recapture USS Philadelphia. I think it's time for us to call for several new aspects of this policy. First, to define a pirate exclusion zone that would allow the immediate boarding and or sinking of any vessel leaving Somalia waters not approved and certified for sea by allied forces. Secondly, an expedited legal regime permitting the summary trial and detention of pirates captured on the high seas. Third, a blockade of pirate-dominated ports like Hobio, Somalia. And fourth, broad powers and authority given to on-scene commanders to attack and arrest pirates once they dare to leave Somalia's 12-mile territorial limit. This would include the summary sinking of pirate ships if a local commander deemed warranted. Additionally, I think we should explore actions to attack the financial links between pirates and terror groups, such as Al-Shabaab, and target pirates with financial sanctions the same way we do with terrorist networks. In the recent wake of the tragedy on the Arabian Sea, where American missionaries were gunned down in cold blood, I'm hopeful that many of my colleagues will be willing to join me in taking up bold action against pirates operating in the waters off East Africa. It's ironic that the United States and our allies currently station expensive and substantial naval forces against pirates, but they are, not limit, they are, they are limited from taking any aggressive action against them. While the pirates have su substantial strength on the ground in Somalia, once they put to sea, we can be their masters, and they have very weak means of opposing us.
A set of vessels blockading pirate-dominated ports with aggressive orders to attack or sink any vessel leaving Somalia should make quick work of pirate operations. Mr. President, uh, the cost of oil and the price of gas in the United States is already high enough. Further increases could endanger our slowly recovering economy. As part of the effort to stabilize the price of gasoline in the United States, we need to recover Jefferson's policy to attack and defeat pirates on the high seas, and especially in this case, as they soon leave Somalia's territorial waters. In addition, Mr. President, I'd like to address one other unrelated subject. As this body begins to finalize final spending legislation for the remainder of the year, I'd like to highlight the growing danger to the U.S. economy and our country. We all know that our national debt now tops $14 trillion. But we should note that we are borrowing $35 billion additionally each week, or about $5 billion a day. The $4 billion cut made by the current spending bill approved by Congress yesterday would not even stop our borrowing for one additional day. That $4 billion cut represents just 3, or sorry, 0.3% of this year's annual deficit, or just three one-hundredths of a percent of the current money that we owe. The famous Harvard economic historian Neil Ferguson has said that you can mark the decline of a country when it pays more money to its lenders than to its army. We have already crossed that point. This year, the Congressional Budget Office estimates that interest payments that we pay to our money lenders will top $225 billion this year. That's more than the cost of our army, which we currently estimate costs about $195 billion, or our Air Force, which we estimate costs about $201 billion, or even our Navy, which costs $217 billion this year. Our money lender costs now are higher than the entire gross domestic product of the country of Denmark at $201 billion. We must pay $4 billion per week in interest or $616 million per day to our money lenders. What's worse, interest payments are expected to more than double over the next decade and will top $778 billion. That means soon we will have to pay our money lenders more than it costs to operate our Army, Navy, and Air Force combined at $623 billion. Remember also that interest payments on the debt are a form of wealth transfer from hardworking middle-class Americans that pay federal taxes to wealthy lenders, now many of them, who live abroad. For those in the Senate who are opposing budget constraints put on by the House, we should force them to admit that they either for higher taxes for the American people or more borrowing that transfers wealth from hardworking middle-class Americans to high-income money lenders, most of whom now live abroad. And with that, Mr. President, I yield back and would suggest the absence of a quorum. Will the, will the senator withhold his request? I, I withhold. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator from Arizona, Mr. President, recognized. I ask unanimous consent to speak in morning business for 10 minutes. Without objection. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, actually, I want to speak on the uh, pending business before the Senate. We're hoping that uh, in maybe 45 minutes or so, we'll actually be able to vote on the Feinstein Amendment to the patent bill. And I'm hoping that my colleagues will vote against the Feinstein Amendment and support uh, the authors of the legislation. I noted yesterday that every version of the patent bill from 2005 forward had included the primary sort of centerpiece reform of the bill, which is so-called first to file. Uh, it may seem strange, but it has not been the case in the past that um, our law is that, uh, the, that you have a patent when you file it. That is to say that, that uh, the, the first person to file on the patent is the one who has the patent, that the patent dates to the day you file it. I mean, that's what we do in law in virtually every other, every other situation I can uh, imagine. Instead, what has been the law 
um, uh, is that uh, if a, it's called the first to invent. And one of the reasons that the whole patent reform movement began uh, five or six years ago was that this concept is very costly and difficult to administer because it relies on a lot of legal discovery and legal process to resolve questions or disputes between who actually conceived of the idea first and then did they apply the necessary diligence to, um, to get it patented. As a result, every other industrial country uh, uses the first to file and um, most of the, uh, of the companies in the United States are obviously used to that because of the patents that are worldwide in, in scope. So the fundamental reform here of the patent legislation to simplify, to reduce costs, to reduce the potential for litigation was to uh, uh, conform our system to that and the rest of the world, the first to file. And uh, what the Feinstein Amendment would do is to throw that over and uh, to say, no, we're going to go back to the concept of this first to conceive of the idea or first to invent notion. Now, whether intended or not, that will kill the bill. It is a poison pill amendment because um, the, the whole concept of the legislation and everything that follows from it is based upon this first to file date. And as I'll note a little bit later, um, the bill simply wouldn't work. Otherwise, you'd have to uh, scrap it and, and start from scratch. And in fact, most of the reforms that are in here wouldn't exist because you'd have to be going back to that first concept of first to invent. And so all of the savings and uh, simplified uh, procedures uh, uh, would simply not be possible. So uh, unfortunately, I, I would note that if my colleagues have any notion of supporting the Feinstein Amendment, they should realize that were it to pass, it would kill the bill. And uh, I don't think that's what we want to do. There are so many improvements that have been made in here, so many groups that are supportive of it. All three of the major groups that have been working on the legislation are in support of the legislation and oppose the Feinstein Amendment because they want us to move forward. We haven't had a patent reform in many, many years. And I think everybody recognizes that it's time. First and foremost, the administration and the patent office itself. The patent office supports the legislation, opposes the Feinstein Amendment. Uh, in fact, one of the good things from the patent office's um, uh, point of view is that the fees that have been collected from uh, the filing fees for the inventors have not all gone to the patent office and they are woefully understaffed and underfunded in uh, working through the thousands and thousands of patents that are filed every year. And as we can all appreciate, our competitiveness in the world depends first on the ability of our people to invent things and secondly to acquire the legal rights to those inventions so that they have property interest in them. Investors can then count on a return on their investment if they supply the capital for the invention to be brought to market and so on. So it's a critical thing that we're talking about here. And we just urge my colleagues who perhaps haven't focused as much on this amendment uh, and on the patent reform legislation itself, understand we're talking about something very, very important here something that can create jobs, that is important to the competitiveness of our country. And the beauty is that uh, unlike a lot of what we do around here, this is totally bipartisan. I'm a Republican. The administration supports the legislation. It has Senator Leahy's name on it as the chairman of the Judiciary Committee. In the House, uh, it is supported by Republicans and Democrats. So it's important that we move this legislation through. And as I said, unfortunately, the Feinstein Amendment would result in having to scrap the bill. There's no point in it if we're not going to um, comply with this first to file notion. Now, let me be a little bit more specific here. One of the reasons why you wouldn't be able to move forward with the bill is the bill's entire post-grant review process, which is a big part of the bill, uh, it would be impossible for the uh, patent office to administer under the discovery intensive invention date issues that arise under the first to invent system. And that's because, as I said, uh, under that system, you come before the patent office and say, well, I, I realize nobody had a record of this, but I actually thought of this idea way back in 1999. And um, uh, I've got a couple of notes here that I made to myself, and I, I dated them, and so that shows that it, well, all, you can see all of a sudden you're getting into a big discovery and legal process here, and that's what we're trying to get away from. So the whole post-grant review uh, concept would be turned upside down if we went back to the uh, first to invent uh, kind of notion. Also, striking the first to file provisions would greatly increase the workload for the patent and trade office. 
And one of the things we're trying to do is to simplify the procedure so that it can get its work done and get these patents approved so that our businesses can better compete out there in the world and also provide more money for them to do this job. And that would also be jeopardized as a result of this. So um, we would just add backlogs and delays and, and not enable our patent office to do what we're asking it to do. And as I said, that's one of the reasons the Patent and Trade Office opposes the Feinstein Amendment and supports the underlying legislation. Now, it's interesting, most American companies already use the first to file because it's obviously easiest. It's the it's the most direct way to confirm the fact that you uh, have that patent at that time. And it's very hard to win a patent contest through what's called an interference of proceeding if you weren't the first to file, which, of course, is logical. And because all of the other countries in the world use a first to file system, if you want your patent to be valid outside of the United States, you need to comply with first to file in any event. And fully, uh, from our most innovative companies, more than 70% of their licensing revenues comes from overseas. So obviously they're already going to be com uh, complying with the first to file concept. It doesn't, the, the Feinstein Amendment doesn't so much therefore switch the system uh, with which Americans are complying today as it simply allows American companies to only have to comply with one system rather than two. As I said before, the first to file concept is clearer, faster, more transparent, and provides more certainty to inventors and to manufacturers. On the other hand, the first to invent concept would make it impossible in many instances to know who has priority and which of competing patents is the valid one. To determine who has priority under the first to invent, expensive discovery must be conducted, and the Patent and Trade Office or the courts must examine notebooks and other evidence to determine who conceived of the invention first and whether the inventor then diligently reduced it to practice. Under the first to file, on the other hand, an inventor can get priority simply by filing a provisional application. And this is an important point. It is, it is so easy. It's not as if the first to file is hard to do. This provisional application, which only costs $110 for the uh, small inventor here, um, only requires that you write a description of, how your, uh, of what your invention is and how it works. That's all. And that's the same thing that an inventor's notebook would have to contain uh, under the first to invent concept if you're ever going to prevail in court with it. But because a provisional is a government document, the date is clear. There's no opportunity for fraudulently backdating the invention date. There's no need for expensive discovery into, you know, what did the inventor know and when did he know it. So. Um, it's, it's, it, you're essentially not requiring anything in addition. You file the provisional application. You've got an entire year then uh, to get all of your work together and, and file your official application, but your date is as of the time you file the provisional application. As I said, for a small entity, uh, only $110. That, that grace uh, period uh, makes it clear that the patent will not be invalid because of disclosures made by the inventor or someone who got information from an inventor during the one year before filing. And that's important because a lot of academics or folks go to trade shows, they begin talking about their concepts and what they've done. And uh, if you've disclosed this, you've got a year to file after you've disclosed the information. Uh, and no other disclosure, regardless of whether it was obtained from the inventor, can then invalidate the invention. So I think the bill has been very carefully written uh, to protect the small inventor or the academic. We've really tried to do that. This is not a case of big versus small, uh, although people on, on both big and small support the legislation. Uh, if anybody suggests that, well, the, the Feinstein Amendment is to protect the small inventor, it does not protect the small inventor. In fact, as I said, the legislation is very carefully corrected to give the small inventor a variety of ways to ensure that, uh, that he or she is protected. Um, the first coalition to bring the whole idea of patent reform to the Congress, the Coalition for 21st Century Patent Reform, uh, is very strongly in support of the legislation and in opposition to the Feinstein Amendment. In fact, it noted in a statement released Wednesday that not only does it oppose the amendment, it would, it would oppose the entire bill if the amendment were to be adopted and, uh, and this uh, first to file concept struck, stricken from the, the bill. In fact, here's what they said. The first inventor to file provisions currently in S-23 form the linchpin that makes possible the quality improvements that S-23 promises. And here's what the uh, SAP or Statement of Administration, Obama Administration Policy uh, says. It lays out exactly what's at stake, and I'm, I quote, 
By moving the United States to a first-to-file system, the bill simplifies the process of acquiring rights. This essential provision will reduce legal costs, improve fairness, and support U.S. innovators seeking to market their products and services in the global marketplace. Uh, and then continuing uh, the, uh, the uh, statement, most of the arguments in opposition to the bill and the uh, uh, FITF appear to be decades-old contentions that have been fully and persuasively rebutted. As one example, the National Research Council of the National Academics assembled a group of leading patent professionals, economists, and, and uh, uh, academics who spent four years intensely studying these issues and concluded in 2004 that the move to the uh, FITF represented a necessary change for our patent system to operate fairly, effectively, and efficiently in the 21st century. I go on to say, without retaining uh, uh, S-23's current first-to-file provisions, uh, the bill would no longer provide meaningful patent reform. Let me repeat that again. If the Feinstein Amendment were to prevail, the bill would no longer provide meaningful patent reform. As an example, the new provision on post-grant review of patents, an important new mechanism for assuring patent quality, could no longer be made to work. Instead of a patent reform bill, what would remain of S-23 would essentially be an empty shell. So, Mr. President, conclusion, well, well, let me finish the statement. Thus, the statement concludes, we could not continue our support for passage of S-23 without the first inventor to file provisions. It would place us in the unfortunate provision, position among the largest, longest, most ardent supporters, end of quote. And just to conclude, the um, National Association of Manufacturers which represents both large and small manufacturers in every industrial sector, has also made it clear that it strongly opposes the amendment. And uh, I'll conclude by quoting uh, from that group's statement in opposition to the Feinstein Amendment, quote, the NAM supports transitioning the United States from a first-to-invent system to a first-to-file system to eliminate unnecessary cost and complexity in the U.S. patent system. Manufacturers, large and small, operate in the global marketplace and the United States needs to move toward a system that will provide more patent protection around the world for our innovative member companies. The first to file provision currently included in S23 achieves this goal." End of quote. So, Mr. President, I hope that my colleagues uh, will pay close attention to the arguments that have been made by uh, Chairman Leahy, the arguments that I've made in opposition to the Feinstein Amendment. Whether intended or not, uh, it would be a poison pill, would kill the legislation if it were adopted. We need to move this important legislation forward, as the administration notes in its statement of policy, and therefore I urge my colleagues, uh, when we have an opportunity to vote on the Feinstein Amendment, to vote against it and to support the legislation as filed. What?